you can flip a negative mood on its head. This was a talk that was all over the place, but then New York, you are all over the place. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. Hello, I'm David Canfield with Entertainment Weekly. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am joined by Kirsten Johnson, director of the film Dick Johnson is Dead, which is now streaming on Netflix and was a huge breakout at this year's Sundance International Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us, Kirsten. Uh, David, it's so, I, I'm actually thrilled to be at the 92nd Street Y, even though I'm not there, but the idea However, that it means a lot to me and to be talking to you is very special. However, virtually, I've been steadily at the 92nd Street Y for, I guess, seven months now. So, <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a crazy time. Um, your movie just broke my heart, put it back together. Uh, really one of my favorites of the year. And I know that's true of a lot of people who have seen it. Um, I just wanted to start there. This is such a personal project. Obviously, we are joined here by the immortal <laughs> Dick Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> what has the experience been like for you sharing this story um, and getting to talk about it with people like me? You know, um, I think of images as relationships. I think of movies as relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't surprise me that they sort of take me into unknown territory. So me mm -hmm. and you talking about this movie at the 92nd Street Y is like, new territory, right? We don't know where this takes us. And part of this movie is all about how do we deal with the unexpected. Um, and what's been unexpected about the responses coming to the movie at this moment is for both my brother and I, sort of people are coming out of the woodwork. We're having a little bit of like, this is your life, Dick Johnson. All these people who we didn't know who knew our parents telling us mm. things about who they were. So in the same way that I've been like trying to figure out how to keep my dad alive forever, suddenly the film's release into the world is bringing us new information about our parents. And I would say one of the most significantly powerful things for me in the last couple of days, um, a man who I didn't know who went to our family's church, whose four-year-old child died of meningitis. I didn't know him. He wrote about the way my mother and my father sort of would just invite their family over to do things and to, to like, you know, pick blackberries and make blackberry pie and have dinner. And I, it suddenly struck me. I didn't know when I was a child what grief was, uh, but my mother knew because her, she had been driving when her mother was killed in a car accident. And um, I think there's this thing about territory. Some of us have passed into the territory where we understand the shape of grief. Mm. Others of us have not passed into that territory. It's gotta be someone you really, really love, who mm. you've lost, who you can't, like you can't imagine the world without them, and then suddenly they're gone. And then the world becomes a new kind of territory. Mm -hmm. and. That only happened to me, I'm one of the lucky ones. It happened to me late. It happened to me when I was a 41 year old with the death of my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and, but now I live in that territory and I've decided I've got to make that territory a little more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that that effort towards fun, as you say, really it starts with the movie's title, Dick Johnson's Dead, which is, it, it is a playful title in a lot of ways. And it captures the tone of the film so particularly. Did that, did, did figuring that title out help you? I wondered to, to help to, to find the tone of this movie. I mean, I gotta say, it's irreverent, this title. And I woke up like in a cold sweat after I had made the decision to call it this, because I was like, I can't do that. Like, my father's still alive. I can't call this movie Dick Johnson is Dead. And we actually have had, like, several people, like, write emails and like, is Dick dead? You know, like, people who know him and care about him. But part of my mission, the shared mission of all the people who worked on this film, is that it's, a, it's an experiment. It's an experiment, mm -hmm. almost like an existential experiment. And um, we want to sort of work with cinema language to um, sort of be in time in a different kind of way. And, and so, you know, Dick Johnson is dead is not true right now, but someday it will be. And the mm -hmm. film will be transformed in the future by how it 
the shift in the titles. Um, so so that's, for me, it's like this, like the the present and the future, the um, the known, the unknown. How do these sort of these like polar ends of human experience, like how are they a spectrum? So my father has dementia and there are parts of him that are already dead. Dick Johnson is dead. Um, mm -hmm. The Dick Johnson who could carry on a long conversation with me, the Dick Johnson who could read a novel, the Dick Johnson who could remember the start of a movie when he was watching it, that Dick Johnson is dead. And yet the Dick Johnson who says to me every day, I just wanna make sure that you know I love you, that Dick Johnson is alive. Mm. Lovely. The film, of course, follows you making this movie about your father repeatedly fake dying in a sense and, and staging it in ways that, are, that range from a little more mundane to a little more um, outrageous. Um, what you're talking about in terms of that evolution of, of how the film will live on um, beyond Dick, I think speaks to the movie spirit in a lot of ways because it it evolves as it moves. You know, you go from Seattle to New York, and and the, the tone of the film changes as as his dementia does um, increase in, in severity. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, in real time what that process was like for you making this movie while also your relationship with your father changing and, and to this to this project? Yeah. Well, David, before I made Big Johnson is Dead, I, I made a film called Camera Person. And I had been... One of my favorites. <laughs> uh, thanks. So, you know, I had traveled all around the world, um, filmed sort of in the aftermath of, I would say, five genocides, you know, Bosnia, yeah. Darfur, the Holocaust, you know, Rwanda. Um, and I had encountered a lot of people who, um, you know, survived the most horrific of human experience and not all of them but a shocking number of them are hilarious and i mean like truly you're like holding your stomach it hurts so bad because you're laughing so hard yeah. and you know it's sort of like wow okay if you you have survived seeing your family killed, seeing racism like destroy your world, and you still have a sense of humor? Well, those of us who uh, have had a slightly like easier luck of the draw, let's try to imagine um, how do we go beyond just weeping about this world? How do we go about like attempting to, you know, be outraged and change some of the things in the world but also just how to like be a gentle, humble human being who knows how to laugh, who so many of these people I filmed were. And in camera person, I used footage I'd shot in all these different places, um, but I used it sort of in service of saying, I was behind the camera here. I experienced this and this leaves me with all these questions. And in the film, the wonderful editor that I work with named Nels Bangerter, he cut a shot of my mom's ashes first and then he cut this piece of footage that I, it was too painful for me to look at. It was like this mm -hmm. tiny piece of footage I had of my mom when she had Alzheimer's. And I didn't know he was going to do that. And the first time I saw it, I, I, it was like this shock went through me and I thought my mm -hmm. mom was alive. Wow. You know, she'd been dead for like 10 years and it just was yeah. like, and that, like that feeling just for an instant was part of what like made me think with this film we can, cinema can do that. You know, cinema, Buster mm. Keaton died long before I ever saw a Buster Keaton movie, but he is alive for me when I'm watching his films, right? Um, wow. So that's what I became sort of interested in. So like, how does, how do movies keep people alive? Uh, and that was this big question. Mm. So from there, obviously the, the obvious juxtaposition here is that you are... <laughs> Killing her in, right. in the sex position. Well, then that leads quickly to the why shouldn't I kill my father over and over again so that I can bring him back to life, right? Like you asked my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is it is interesting the way that the movie does play with life and death in that way. Um, how did those um, how did those images first start coming to you of, of what this would look like on camera? Because it obviously it's kind of illusory it's it's vivid it's it's all those right. well operative word is play that you use right this is play 
that we're doing. Yeah. Um, but also, like, you know, my dad was a shrink. He was a psychiatrist all his life. Like, you know, we've had lots of conversations about um, why do people do the things that they do? The complexity of human psychology, like, uh, is a constant shared interest of ours. And, you know, so, so, but when I said to him, like, Dad, what if we made this movie where we worked with stunt people and we killed you over and over again? And he's like, he's like, huh. <laughs> and, you know, quickly, hmm, why would my daughter wish to do that, right? And I wish to do that out of love, right, because I want him not to disappear. So the, yeah. you know, bringing him back idea. Um, but one of the things that I've thought a lot about over the years is sort of what is an indelible image. Um, mm. And, you know, in my experience, some of the images that haunt me or some images that have traumatized me by, by seeing them, you know, when I say that word, that set of words, indelible images to you, I'm sure something comes to your mind. Some image that you've seen that in some ways you can't get out of your mind. And yeah. as a photographer or a filmmaker, like in some ways we're encouraged to search for indelible images. Um, and indelible images are often bodies in positions we are unfamiliar seeing bodies in. So mm. we are unfamiliar seeing dead bodies and we're certainly unfamiliar seeing the dead body of a loved one. Um, mm. Which I think is why so many people have such strong feelings and legitimately so about people's dead bodies sort of being used in the service of other people's entertainment of other people's um, uh, experience of world news, um, you know, and there's always sort of this question of like, what if that was your family? What if that was your child lying washed up on the beach? What if that was your child who had been suffocated by the police? Then what is that image? And yet we know that these images can change injustice in society. So I'm always sort of, you know, wondering those questions about which images are okay to show um, and to what purpose are they being shown. Um, so the film is full of questions about that, I would say. Mm. There's one scene uh, in the film, one death scene, I suppose you could call it, where you know, it's taking place in the streets of New York and, and things get a little, you know, reality starts to, I think, um, fill into the into the scene you're constructing and there's this line like we have to stop um how were you finding that line as you were going along and um both and trying to find that balance between protecting your father and and having him play along yeah yeah well i mean i think ethical questions are sort of the core of the work of filming and photography like mm -hmm. why is someone letting us film us film them, for what purpose are we filming? Um, what happens when we film? Um, so, you know, the fact is I had this idea and then it took me some time to get the money to make it. And in that time, I went from not being consciously aware that my father had dementia to suddenly being like, oh my, like here I go, parent number two with dementia, which I was just like, ah, this can't be happening, <laughs> right? Because I'd been yeah. through it once before. Um, and I really considered giving all the money back to Netflix and saying like, oh. actually, I can't make this movie. My dad has dementia. Um, and then I realized in some ways, I, I am going to be living with this dementia. He is going to be living with this dementia. Can making this movie give us new tools? And, you know, I think a lot of people suffer privately with this work. They suffer privately with the work of caregiving. You know, mm. if you think about all of the nurses right now who are on the front line dealing with patients who, you know, like are putting, they're putting the nurses at risk. So they have that stress, but then, you know, they're often dealing with patients who are not fully mentally present. That stress of caregiving is so extreme. And yet until you do it, you don't know how bad it is. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, in some ways it felt like um, sharing the difficulty of dementia publicly um, was 
meaningful because I think we, in some ways, it's so hard to face some of the pain uh, mm -hmm. that we pretend it isn't there or we're in denial about it. And the amazing thing about my father, um, he took care of my mother throughout her dementia and um, he was able to see it as a disease that she had and to be compassionate through that period. My mother was never able to um, recognize that she had dementia. My father still to this day knows that he has it, um, will be empathetic to me about me taking care of him. You know, sort of saying it must be hard to watch your father losing his mind. So he's mm. like a remarkable self-awareness and sort of a remarkable interest in like, how does the human mind work? What is a self? So if there was ever a person that I could sort of engage on the level of ethical difficulty with, he and mm. I like talked about it. I mean, and we had some of the most like amazing elliptical, like going around and around me saying, do you think it's okay for us to do this? And he'd say, oh, Absolutely. And then I would say, what do you think about this? And he'd say, what are you talking about? I said, well, do you think it's okay for us to do this? And he'd say, no, not at all. And so, you know, that's what dementia yeah. is. It's sort of in and out of all of these yeah. different perspectives on something. And that's the way I see ethics. That they're not, it's not so cut and dry how to not be complicit in evil, uh, how not to have blind spots. Like it's, it's pretty complicated, actually. Yeah, to be facing those questions from multiple angles, I imagine was probably a new filmmaking experience for you beyond even the, the personal aspect of it. Yeah, you're so spot on. I mean, it really was like, we made this decision, the process of this film was going to be unlike any profit process any of us had been involved in. Um, so, you know, most of the team were experienced documentary filmmakers. And what we know is the unexpected is going to happen. You know, if I'm filming the day that my father is moving out of his building, uh, I know something's going to happen. What I didn't know is that, you know, this wonderful man, Mike, who works for the building, would sit down and talk to my father because they liked each other. Mike was really sad my dad was leaving the building. And, you know, we learned that Mike's father drowned when he was an eight-year-old. And so suddenly we're having this profound conversation I never saw coming. The act of filming sort of generates that conversation um, and opens up this question of, you know, we all die, but some of our deaths are, are um, in the context of having lived full lives. Other, like other deaths, like people are robbed. Their lives are robbed from them like way too early. So the, the sort of, you know, I don't want to say comparison, but like, you know, we all know like some people get raw deals in this world. And yeah. so sort of, you know, like I knew I'm making a film about my dad. Like, who cares? He's a nice man. He's had a nice <laughs> life. He's got great kids. He's a white man in America. Like, really? Do we need yeah. another film about an old white man? Like, not really, actually. And yet he's the only dad I got. He's my dad and can his openness sort of lead us into this territory where we ask questions about grievability. Whose deaths do we notice? Uh, whose deaths do we care about? Whose deaths have value? Whose deaths get remembered? All of those questions can come up in this film. Um, so just to talk to you about process, like what was cool was like, okay, we know we can count on the unexpected happening. We just don't know what it's gonna look like. So, right. all right, we do that. We start the editing process really early. We edit a documentary scene and then we say, okay, how can we create a fictional death that will then enter this scene? And then we'd show it to my dad and my dad would be like, that's not funny. And they was like, okay, well we could add some VFX blood and, and, and basically like dad participated in the edit by watching and rewatching the film until he'd laugh at things. Hmm. And when dad laughed, it was like, all right, okay, we're getting to yeah. the <laughs> But you know, there's a scene with my father's caregiver, the wonderful Marta Baida in the film. And she and dad were watching a cut of the film together, you know, as she was taking care of him one afternoon. And Marta uh, started talking about the film. And I said, you know what, Marta, can I film you? 
And she was like, yeah. And then, you know, so you have this wonderful scene that then enters the film and breaks the film again. So it was sort of this idea that we keep making it and breaking it and making it mm. and breaking it, which is a little bit how dementia functions. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I wanted to talk about camera person relation to this a little bit too, because as you, as you mentioned, that's that's a film that really covers the whole world. It covers the globe in a lot of ways. And it's just still an incredibly personal project. But then with this one, you're really bringing it into your home and it's incredibly intimate. Um, and that felt like such an interesting contrast to me. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that since this is your first film, since Camera Person, what that shift was yeah. like for you. I mean, what Camera Person freed me in all of these ways, right? Because Camera Person was such a... Um, it was so private when I was making and I didn't know if anyone would understand it because mm -hmm. um, it's a film that has no voiceover. Um, yeah. Just drop you into the world that I'm filming and then drop you into another world. And what I think was so cool is that um, not only did people understand it, but they related to it. I think because the world has changed. We're all camera people now. Everybody's got a phone in their pocket and you know, if you're in the street and you see something happening to another person, do you do something? Do you film it? Mm -hmm. If you're playing with your children in the park, do you film them? If you're with your lover, do you film them? Or if you're with your dying parent, do you pull out your phone, right? So everybody understands these ethical questions. Everybody wonders, is it okay? Is it not okay that I film? So that all the questions that I had in camera person are suddenly the questions of the planet, right? <laughs> Mm, yeah. <laughs> big questions. <laughs> yeah, big questions. I don't mess around. Life's too short. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who knows your work knows you do not mess around. With the big not mess around. Even though my my dad is messing around, he's like moving around. Um, my dad is not here with me in my apartment. My dad during the pandemic, um, I had to quarantine because I had traveled to Madrid, and my brother came and got my father, and my father got to live with my brother from March until mm. July. And then uh, we both just realized the dementia had advanced so far that we needed to move him into a dementia care facility because basically what happens is time expands so much that my brother yeah. would have had to give up his whole life to keep taking care of my dad um, in some ways as I did. But luckily for me, I was making a movie at the time <laughs> so yeah. I could do it. <laughs> But, um, so my dad is, is not, not here, but he's here. And I just talked to him today and told him I was going to be, um, talk to the 92nd street Y. And he was like, don't a lot of old people go and listen to programs there. And I was like, I think they do. <laughs> and, and he said, he said, well, you know, I don't think of myself as an old person, but I guess I belong in their company. Wow. My dad's 88. And I was like, I was like, you know, none of us think of ourselves as old people, but we are honored to be in the company <laughs> of anyone <laughs> who yeah. attends a 92nd Street Y program. So and Dad says hello to everyone, even though he's only here as a flimsy image. And we certainly feel his presence here. Uh, um, but he's seen the film, correct? Several times I've, I've heard. <laughs> literally hundreds of times. Yeah. Literally, because he can't. At this point, he can't remember that he's seen it. And it's also, it represents time travel to him. He can see his friends in Seattle. He can see himself driving a car. He can see our old home. He can see his old office. Um, he can see his own funeral. So, um, you know, it gives him back his memories. Hmm. So to that, uh, a few specific scenes I wanted to ask you about, beginning with the, the, the funeral that you stage for um, your father and you bring in you know, so many uh, of his, of his loved ones uh, from over the years. What? I, I have two questions about this. Yeah. One, yeah, yeah. The, the logistics yeah. uh, of doing that. And then two, what it was like for you to, to see it and, and create it uh, and then watch it play out. Well, you know, I, I part of this work is you got to have respect for people, right? And what are their worlds? So the first person I called was the pastor of the church, um, who knows and loves my dad. And I described to him what I wanted to do. And he said, you know, the church isn't a performance space. Um, but he said, I know if everyone who loves your dad comes together for this, no one will be performing. They mm -hmm. all are grieving already his loss. 
And, and I was like, wow, you are awesome. <laughs> right? Like how great is that? Um, that that was his take on it. And um, he said, it's okay with me, you know, and write a letter to the people you want to reach out to the people you want to. And let's see if anyone wants to come. And I talked to my brother about it. And my brother said, you know, I don't think anyone's going to want to do this. <laughs> and I said, well, it's just okay. But are you okay with me asking? So then I started reaching out to my father's closest friends and several of them laughed because they know my dad well. Ray DeMaza, who's a man who really mm -hmm. makes the scene. Absolutely. The movie, right? Because he shows the deepest emotion in the scene. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's 91 years old and he was just like, oh yeah, let's do this. He's like, it's now or never. Um, so the, you know, the, like in some ways the most old people were the most willing to um, face it. Um, it was a lot of younger people in their 40s and 50s were like, ooh, this makes me a bit squeamish. Yeah. Um, and that kind of reminds me of like the way I was as a young camera person. A lot of times I stopped filming before people asked me to stop. Mm. I was uncomfortable with the feelings, right? Um, so there were certain people who said, I can't do it, I don't want to be there. and. I respected that, but several of those people changed their minds at the last minute because all of their friends were going, <laughs> yeah. including my brother, who, you know, once he found out that lots of people were showing up, but my original idea, I was going to put dad in an open casket at the front of the church. And my brother was like, over my dead body. We can't do that to dad. And at first I was really mad at my brother. And then I was like, oh, he's totally right. Like, that's a terrible idea but maybe cinema language can help us. So we filmed for one whole day in an empty church with an open casket and filmed sort of the behind the scenes of getting my dad in and out of the casket, the emotions that created in me. And I'll tell you, it is not cute to see your yeah. parent in a casket, but it's really fun to pull them back out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I try, like I did um, for the crew, I did, I, I did a couple of versions of eulogies and yet they weren't true. They were performances. You know, I wasn't able to completely go there because I was yeah. being a director, being a camera person. And then what? I'm going to like pretend it's really my dad's death. I couldn't do it. Um, yeah. And then we had the funeral the next day and we really, I have this amazing team of producers. Um, Katie Chevenier, Marilyn Ness, Maureen Ryan, who've all worked on incredible films that everybody knows. And um, they all said, you know, we got to think about which role you are in at which time, because you can't do it all simultaneously. Um, mm. So for example, my father, when people entered the church, my father was up in the balcony with headphones on, but no one saw my father when they first entered the church and I didn't have a camera. I was greeting them as if I would be greeting them at his funeral. I asked everyone if they would speak of him in the past tense um, when they spoke in front of the church. But, you know, when people were walking in, we talked about the fact I was making a movie, but it was actually pretty solemn. It was pretty real. Uh, I felt mm -hmm. like I was welcoming people to my father's funeral for real. A um, lot of gravitas. And then, and then I went up and filmed with him up in the balcony um, as he listened to people say what they had to say about him. And there was one moment he was just sobbing and I was sobbing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this, I know it's really hard, dad. And then he just, he goes, yeah, I really miss this guy. He's such a great guy. <laughs> and he totally punked me. I was like, dad, <laughs> but, but you know, like I, in some ways it's true. He does really miss this guy. He misses the him that doesn't have dementia. Um, we really wanted to get that scene in the movie and we didn't, but, uh, you know, mm. that was the kind of stuff that was going on during the funeral. So I felt all of the emotions. I felt like the pressure of putting on a good party, the pressure of trying to direct a good movie, the, like the real responsibility of being a decent daughter, all of it. Yeah. Mm. You're wearing a lot of hats in that scene. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So if we talked about like expecting the unexpected and knowing that was coming here, but as people are filing in, 
did it, did it run as, as you thought it would in terms of the way people reacted? I mean, dad was so funny. He was like, there aren't very many people here. He's like, I thought there'd be a lot more people here. <laughs> and he's like, much ado about nothing. <laughs> and, yeah. and I was like, I was like, oh my God, we need more people here. Like, you know, so we were having feelings like that. We were nervous. Um, and then, you know, the fact of someone like my dad's best friend going beyond knowing that my dad was alive and, and allowing himself to show publicly how much he cares about my father, to see a grown man weep uncontrollably was mm -hmm. just, it was just like, you know, I had this incredible respect for my father that he was sort of willing to risk his own dignity in the service of this project, you know, even though mm -hmm. he trusts me, like, we're trying to make a comedy about him dying, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily like there's transgression in it, you know, like we're, we're trying to, you know, jackass inspired us in lots of ways, right? Yeah. Um, but to sort of take those risks and to watch Ray take that risk, um, it was part of what led me later to say, oh, I gotta do, I gotta put some voiceover in this movie. I never wanted mm -hmm. to, but you know, I realized there's all these people who've thrown themselves under the bus on behalf of this film. They've like revealed themselves and I have to do the same thing. Um, so people gave me courage. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is like what, what art does for us, right? It gives us courage to like imagine ourselves as different than we are. It gives us the courage to say like, ah, that person had it rougher than I do. And they did that then. All right. You know, like time to Absolutely. stand up. It's work. <laughs> Absolutely. What, what would you say was the, the most daunting thing that you had to do on working on this film? I mean, the daunting was keeping my father safe, you know, because, mm. um, as anyone who is a parent knows, there's like this period of time when your kids have no clue uh, that they can die. Yeah. And, you know, and I have this like, I've got twins. So I have this remarkable moment where I was like out on LaGuardia Place, eating out on a patio and the kids were with me. I was by myself and they started giggling and then just took off in opposite directions, running in opposite directions towards oncoming traffic. And they're like two and a half. And it was just, you know, like this sort of horrible Sophie's Choice moment of like, okay, I'm going. And I literally to this day can't remember which one I ran after first because like I can't even bear. Right. Right. And I caught them both and they were laughing hysterically and I was so angry. Yeah. Um, and with dad, with the dementia, you know, we didn't even have to be filming. Like my dad I would drive my kids to school with my dad. We'd go to the parking garage. And there was one day where the parking attendant was pulling our car out. And for no reason, you know, usually I like walk holding dad's hand for no reason. He just jumped towards the back of the reversing car. Mm. And, and it was just like, you know, whatever, something spatially, the dementia was confusing him. And I was like, dad, are you trying to get yourself killed? And he's like, I'm not trying to, you know, but, but so that thing revealed itself very early on with doing the stunts. It's like, he could be totally on board intellectually. We've got it all set up. We've got a crew of 30 people and all dad has to do is stand on the sidewalk. We've got like safety all around. And then for no reason, he'll just step out because he wants to talk to me. Like, into oncoming traffic nothing to do with the stunt itself just yeah, right like yeah. so that was you know when we talk about the ethical dilemmas of it in real life not just in the movie i had the responsibility to keep him safe but i was not always capable of it so that's yeah. the scariest part right like and the wandering right like oh this person's just going to open the door and disappear and you don't know where they've gone hmm. Um, the other main scene I wanted to ask you about, I guess almost more of a vignette, which is before the funeral, there is this, let's call it an audience scare where we are in an ambulance and we've, we've been told about uh, Dick have, having had a heart attack and, um, you know, we don't really know what's going on. Um, obviously, I was imagining that there's some intentionality there in terms of playing yes. with our expectations. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about 
that part of the film, which is there throughout, um, which is, you know, taking your, your viewers on a kind of ride too. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, this is all relationships, right? So some people who watch this movie will have seen camera person and mm-hmm. they'll know things about what I do. <laughs> yes. Right. So, uh, as a team, we really think like the audience is quicker than we are. They're quicker than we think. The audience are no fools. Like the audience has lived through some stuff. People have seen some stuff. So what would an audience member who knows I'm Kirsten Johnson and I carry a camera and I'm making a film about my dad dying and I'm doing stunts, what would I do if my dad really had a heart attack? Mm. Well, I wouldn't run back and get my big camera, but... I would certainly have my phone, but then if things got crazy, would I drop my phone and not care about it, right? So we actually like played through all these iterations of what would make this real? What would make this feel real to yeah. like the super sophisticated viewer? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's been one of the original pitches of the film was I'm gonna make this film until my dad really dies for real. Yeah. Um, but the dementia advanced so much that it was like, I was like, actually, no, I think we're done. Like Mm. I I can't, I don't feel like I can um, honestly say I have his full collaboration anymore. And I, 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 that feels like we're too far gone. You know, like one of his final stunts that he did in the movie, there's a scene where he's just taking a bowl, a spoonful of soup with alphabet soup. That was, oh yeah. Stunt. My dad could barely do it because we had like, like the alphabet letters were floating on a sponge. Yeah, it's sort of a break from it. Yeah. yeah, and he couldn't. He he would just be like, "Why am I doing this?" And he like just that one gesture. Wow. And and it was like, okay, I think we're done, right? So mm-hmm. then it became, well, can we create a scene in which it's as real as we can get? You know, and I think some people are very angry at that scene. Um, some people who know he's alive still believed it. Like, did it get you? Did you, did you like go there? What happened? I, I, re- well, actually I knew because yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I knew, but um, I watched with my partner and he, he just, go, Oh no. Like he's literally just sunk. And I didn't say anything cause I didn't want to spoil it. For him. <laughs> um, did he get mad at you afterwards? <laughs> He did, but I feel like we've done this enough where he sort of respects my process with this stuff. Okay. And then midway midway through the funeral scene, I mean, it took him a while to be honest. He goes, wait. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's what we wanted to do, you know, because I think like one of the things I've learned from doctors in this is like death is not like in one position. There's death of the breath. There's death of the brain. There's death of the body, right? And yeah. then it's like, this way that people live on and become even larger in life, in death than they were in life. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like, I mean, sometimes I just think like, I, you know, like I wish George Floyd could know what his death has meant. Mm -hmm. You know, it sort of breaks my heart that his, that he'll never know how much his death has meant to the world. Right. But maybe, you know, like, what do I know? I haven't been on the other side of death, right? Like, maybe he knows. And maybe he's like, more. Can we get some more action, please? You know? um, But but those are questions that the film asks in all these ways. So, like, you know, the heaven and sort of hell scenes that we created, I realized, oh, I don't want an actor to play my mother, you know, it needs to be the real image of my mother. So what do we do? So, okay, we create like a mask, right? Like mm. and we put it on her and then she can move around. Yeah. Um, but it was also sort of a stopgap. Like if my dad can't participate, we've got a mask of him. Like, you know, mm. and that's, and is he, is he that far gone that he can or can't participate? And then what happened was so amazing. He hasn't been able to play the clarinet in years because you know his fingers were arthritic and he thinks he plays badly. And we blasted Benny Goodman and suddenly he was like up and swinging, you know, like did not stop playing the clarinet. And it was so, it was just like, oh, we like gave him his powers back. Like not just on yeah. the screen, but like in real life. Wow. That's really cool. Uh- that is, that is cool. Yeah. Um, you mentioned heaven and beyond the sort of the masks in heaven for your mother. Um, what was it like conceiving of something like that for the, for the screen? And especially in a way that definitely plays with artificiality, but also feels very genuine 
for Dick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, after killing him so much, we were like, we got to give him some of the stuff he loves, you know, like got to like make, give him a comfortable chair, give him some chocolate ice cream, give him some popcorn. <laughs> like, you know, so it's like, yeah. okay, how can this be the pleasure zone? And once we started doing that, you know, it was like, uh, oh, bubbles, fla- you know, flowers, feathers. But, but you know, we had come up with the idea that all those scenes are filmed in slow motion because my dad was looping so much at that point that he would sort of repeat the same thing every few, you know, minutes. So the idea was like, okay, a smile just lasts like, you know, it's very brief, a couple of seconds, but with this super slow-mo camera, this phantom camera, we could stretch these three seconds into four minutes. So we could sort of enter present time, like expand present time. Mm. So, so these were all of these, like we came to the idea slowly, but once we had them, we're like, okay, well now if people are dancing in slow motion, what could we make happen? Oh, could we make a person fly over a car? Could we make a backup singer spew out sequins? And so that it goes from like dream to grotesque, to fantasy, to nightmare, and back again, right? Because that's what this is, yeah. in, you know, in the course of... So what was really cool for me as a director was on that set, and this was different from the first set in the funeral. In the first set, when we were filming the dad in the casket, I was really trying to, like, know what to do. I so didn't know what to do, but yeah. I was trying to be like a director who knew what to do. Like, okay, let's do the shot from this angle and let's do the shot from that angle. Um, but by the time we got to the heaven situation, it was so uncertain. Like we never knew, like, will dad do this? Will dad take off his socks and show his feet? Uh, will dad be able to get up and dance? Will he prefer to sit down right now? Or will he be taking a nap? That I just let go of knowing and, mm. and sort of valued the collaboration with everybody there, you know, like fabulous choreographer, production designer, art designer, cinematographer, all these people who knew that our, you know, protagonist was, ve- was very much a diva. <laughs> and, you know, like who knew what he was going to do? So suddenly right. everybody was like in the unknown and all of a sudden I was like, oh, this is like documentary. <laughs> yeah. Like totally like documentary. You don't know what the world's going to do. You don't know what the person's going to do. And you just, right. you, you follow it as opposed to trying to control it. So now yeah. I'm really excited for making movies going forward. Cause that's how I want to do it. I want to like make some big like spectacles with not <laughs> knowing anything that's going on. I love that. That leads me right into my last question for you, which is it seems like there were a lot of lessons learned along the way. How did this change you as a filmmaker? And, and I guess you've sort of answered it, but how do you, how do you feel going forward uh, making films after this one? I feel more brave. I feel mm. more bold. I feel like let's talk about the things that matter. Let's face the pain together. Let's create new processes. You know, I think um, there's just all of these like old ways, old yeah. ways we tell stories, old ideas about binary things, old ideas about genres, old ideas about values, old ideas about how we represent. Like, I don't want to shoot anybody else while I'm filming, you know, like I, I want new language. So, so I'm going to try to like keep breaking cinema until it breaks me or we like break through to the other side and fly. But, you know, I want, I want audiences to make films with me. So I'm, I'm trying to leave space for my collaborators as we make them try to leave space for the strangeness of the world and then leave space for the audience. So camera person sort of um, like pe- the way people respond to camera person helped me imagine this movie. So I'm kind of counting on the audience <laughs> <laughs> to let me know where I go next. Yeah. Well, um, Get talking, audience. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Where's the chat? <laughs> Where's the chat? We need the live chat function right now. Um, well, thank you so much to Kirsten Johnston. Thank you so much to Dick Johnson, uh, uh, who appeared uh, here. Thank you all of you for watching. The film is Dick Johnson instead. It is now available for streaming on Netflix. You should definitely watch it if you haven't. Um, it's a beautiful 90 minutes spent. Thank you so much again, everybody. I'm David Campfield with Entertainment Weekly. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, David. <laughs>